Okay, welcome to tonight's uh, Reasons to Believe meeting. We have a guest speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Ron Mantra, who's been uh, studying epigenetics. He's a uh, Various uh, findings of epigenetics uh, are causing major disruption in the theory of evolution, and he is going to tonight uh, give us an explanation of what those disruptions are. So, welcome, Dr. Vaughn. I'm going to enjoy your yeah. meeting. Yeah, th uh, thank you for having me. Have you muted everybody? Because there's still a good bit of uh, reverberation in the background still. Yeah, let me make okay. sure uh, uh, everyone is muted. I uh, know, sorry, okay. this person is not muted. Okay, now everyone's muted. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for introducing okay. me and uh, bringing me in. My background is that I um, grew up in Florida, went to Florida State for my degree in biology. And then I went to Birmingham for my degree in medicine at UAB and also did my family practice residency and was a boarded certified, uh, uh, board certified family practitioner my whole career. Um, I also got very much involved in medical research. Um, and the reason was I was one of the first people to have an electronic medical record system. So I could tell you just about everything and whether you're taking an aspirin or not in my practice. And uh, I was able to database and uh, enlist uh, people into particular uh, drug trials. And this is the bottom right. It was one of the trials that I helped write up an article about. The, uh, the reason I started studying epigenetics was I came across this article in Nature Journal. Nature is the premier uh, article in the world. In fact, if, if you looked at the number of articles read in the whole world, 50% of the time, it would be a Nature Journal article. So it's, it's the gold standard. And when I saw this title, I about fell out of my chair. You know, it, it, it is actually questioning the evolutionary theory and saying that we need to rethink. So I started researching this. Now, this is in 14, so it was roughly 10 years ago. It would not, it, it surprises me when I just searched this the other day, but there's over a thousand articles which are similar to the Nature Journal article. In other words, they support uh, a new form of evolution called the extended evolutionary synthesis, which involves epigenetics and other things, but it is different than neo-Darwinism. So this is a, a, uh, an astounding uh, uh, statistic, a thousand articles. In this same period of time, neo-Darwinism and the modern synthesis, which is what we've been living with for 80 years, was only mentioned 200 times, and half of the time, uh, the articles said they need to replace it. In addition to those thousand articles protesting uh, that we need to change the system, 130,000 articles came out on non-Darwinian epigenetics. These are articles like uh, in PubMed that deal with cancer and other things because they're hitting pay dirt and they're finally understanding things because we've moved away from our old system of evolution. This is an article that came out in the Federalist and it says the field of epigenetics is causing a major disruption in the field of evolution. A recent news journal reported that current estimates are that approximately one third of professional academic biologists who do not believe in intelligent design find Darwin's theories inadequate to describe uh, the complexities in biology. And uh, now this was written a few years back. And I would say that really that number is close to 50-50 and I'll show you why with this next article. Um, at the Royal Academy, I mean, the Royal Academy is considered the premier uh, science academy in the world since Newton. Uh, they had a meeting on, on this and a lot of people wrote, article, uh, wrote letters protesting that we should even consider it because it's challenging their, their cherished doctrines. But they did go ahead and have the meeting. And during a question and answer session, Pigalusi, who's proposing this newer theory of evolution, not based on neo-Darwinism, um, one audience member commented that uh, the disagreement between the EES, which is the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis or epigenetics, and the more conservative biologists, the neo-Darwinists sometimes looks more like a culture war than a scientific disagreement. 
And uh, Peg Lucci said, sure, it's a culture war and we're going to win it. And half the room burst out cheering. Now that's astounding. When I was in the late seventies, when I was getting my degree, evolution, Darwin's evolution was a fact like gravity. If somebody said, we're gonna overturn it, nobody would have stood up and cheered. Uh, now we have half of the people cheering. And I'm telling you, these guys are the younger guys. You can look at any uh, college campus at their epigenetic program, and there's nobody in these things more than 30 years of age. Uh, they are taking over the biology because it produces uh, results. So this was in this article done by the Guardian, Do We Need a New Theory of Evolution? And this is a very good article because it gives all the different uh, perspectives of it. Now I'm gonna give you an analogy and this is interesting. This is actually derived by Google Bard artificial intelligence. And it's actually a very good analogy um, to help you understand how epigenetic machinery can act outside of the genes, with the genes being uh, the evolutionary view of neo-Darwinism, mutations, et cetera. It says, imagine that you have plans that contain all the instructions for building the house. So you got the plans in the hands of the constructors. Um, and uh, you notice that you got two by fours, four by fours. Those are the things that are being uh, coded for by DNA, but where they go into place is completely determined by these gentlemen, isn't it? So you can, you can cut a two by four in half instead of keeping it whole. These plans are like the DNA sequence and the epigenetics machinery is like the construction crew that builds the house. The construction crew can follow the instructions in the plans to build a house, but they can also make changes to the instructions. And this is normal building practice. And this, this is the same thing that can happen with epigenetics. For example, they might decide to add an extra room or change the color of the paint. These changes to the instructions uh, will affect the final pro uh, product, even though the underlying plans have not changed. Now, what they mean by this is uh, the plans are still there. The plans are there to maybe uh, paint a yellow room rather than paint a green room. And so they can interpret those plans how they want to. Now, this is a rough analogy, but it really does make a lot of sense. And we'll discuss it later on. Now, now what's interesting is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was a, was a French uh, he was the head of the French uh, botany in Paris, uh, the, the museum, which is a very established uh, thing. He was a war hero and he was granted that place. And he was really very popular in his day. Uh, even Darwin followed him. Dar uh, Lamarck made the comment that we acquire uh, traits uh, and we pass them on to our children. And Darwin was for this, but neo-Darwinists were completely against this concept. Uh, and that's really what epigenetics is. So John Baptiste Lamarck was really the first guy to catch on to what we know today as epigenetics. But the neo darwinists for 100 years won out until epigenetics came along. Conrad Waddington, who's considered the father of the term epigenetics because he published it first in 1940. Uh, and, the, and that astounding, 85 years before we start or we're really getting into it, this guy pre uh, predicted it. Uh, he agreed with Lamarck's ideas. He felt that Lamarck had been abused and ignored for 100 years by the neo-Darwinists. Julian Huxley is the guy that proposed our current theory of evolution, the modern synthesis, in his book, uh, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis. Um, and he combined Darwin's theory of evolution and Mendel's ideas on heredity along with uh, mu mutations and macro and um, micro evolution. And this was what the majority even today follow, although that majority is probably down to 50%. At the same time he published this, Waddington published in the Nature Journal, again, the top journal of the, in the world. He said it's doubtful, however, where even the most statistically modern geneticists are gonna be entirely satisfied that nothing more is involved than sorting out random mutations by the natural selective filter. I mean, this was almost, uh, prophetic, this statement by him. He's just saying, all y'all going to do is just track random mutations. You think that's really what's going to cause everything? But sure enough, that's what they did. Uh, even today, some scientists are doing that. 
um, but they're all regearing now towards uh, epigenetics. So this is what evolution has been for 80 years, tracking random mutations and trying to say that these random mutations are causing micro and, and macro evolution. Then the central dogma came out, and this was by Francis Crick, who discovered the DNA molecule. And from this concept, we get DNA going to RNA, going to protein. But mutations occur in the DNA, which changes the RNA and the protein. And if it's a beneficial mutation, then natural selection works on it and everything's supposedly better. The problem with this model is this represents only 2% of the DNA because only 2% of the DNA codes for protein. 98% of it is considered junk DNA. And it was um, Francis Crick who promoted the idea of junk DNA. Then we had uh, Richard Dawkins' his book, The Selfish Gene, promoted it. And, and they were all claiming, you know, this is the way things work until we had a disaster of a study called the Human Genome Project where we ignored 98% of the DNA and it was a total disaster. He called it the central dogma. It was actually a thumb in the eye to religion. He, you know, there was a guy that said, specifically heard him describe this. He was thought that by calling this a dogma, it would make religion look stupid because this is a truth, a central truth or a dogma. Now, according to uh, the part, the 2% that does work, you have uh, DNA that codes to RNA, and you can see a strand of RNA with different letters, and every three letters is a codon, and it codes for a different amino acid. And you see the different colors on the bottom of different amino acids due to that RNA sequence and codons. And this is, this is in fact correct. What's interesting though, is that we have a lot of redundancy. In other words, it, um, if you look on the far left, <clears throat> the word leucine, L-E-U, um, uh, the top pink left box and, and the next box down, there's six different codons that code for the leucine uh, amino acid. So there's this redundancy. Well, Crit didn't know why it was. And instead of thinking from a teleological purpose, you know, that God did it for a purpose, he just said it, it was, a, it was a frozen accident, which is very non, you know, inquisitive. It's just kind of just accept it, but there's, it's still just random, doesn't really mean anything. Well, we've discovered just recently, it does mean a great deal. Uh, from this, however, uh, they developed the concept of synonymous versus non-synonymous mutations. Synonymous means the same, um, means winding up the same. If on the on the left, you see leucine, L-E-U, and the codon that codes for it can be a U-U-A or U-U-G, and it's still leucine. If you go to the right, you get tyrosine, and A-C-U or A-C-A can code for it. But on the bottom left, you can see that leucine, excuse me a second. This, Okay, here we go. On the bottom left, you see leucine, UUA going to UUC, phenylalanine, and that's called a non-synonymous mutation. What's, what's important about this is when it's not the same mutation, a different amino acid is coded for, and a different amino acid being coded for can cause natural selection if it causes a, a fitter organism. Whereas a synonymous mutation, they we've always heard when I was in college that because it doesn't change the amino acid, it doesn't act for natural selection. It's just neutral. Uh, let me admit somebody real quick. Okay, and what was what happened as a result of this is what's called the Ka over Ks ratio. Uh, the synonymous mutation substitution rate is S. And, and the non-synonymous is A. And if you see in the bottom, in the bottom, um, excuse me. If you see in the bottom left, the different ratios of this thing would cause a different mathematical calculation of different types of selection from purifying selection to neutral to positive. The take home message is, 
they thought that they could apply mathematics to determine what levels of natural selection. It's completely post hoc. And they did this for almost 60 years. And they and if you look, I've done a search uh, in Google Scholar and the number of articles is astounding. There's over 10,000 articles that use this basic concept to determine natural selection. So I was seeing this in college all the time. Well, the KA over KS ratio proves that natural selection was going on because how do you prove it otherwise? So they were, they were wagging this, uh, this calculation in your face and saying, well, this is natural selection, therefore it's happening. Okay, however, this article came out last year and it was a nuclear bomb. They studied the synonymous mutations. Those are the ones that shouldn't change the amino acid in yeast. And they discovered that they were strongly non-neutral. So they had been, they had this, this basically this study negates 10,000 journals over 60 years, eliminating natural selection based on the KS over, KA over KS ratio. This is really amazing if you think about it. So uh, the, what we found out is it's not just, you can't just apply something post hoc uh, in this fashion. Now, what scientists did is they went out there and tried to add other parts to the equation to make it work better. But the whole concept was off from the beginning because you can't just say natural selection occurs in the DNA. It's supposed to occur in the body if it's gonna occur when it's out there. I wrote up an article on this for uh, Reasons to Believe called uh, New Genetic Study Challenges 60 Years of Evolutionary Theory. And you can read that online if you like. So uh, epigenetics to recapitulate is the study of how your behaviors and environment can change uh, that effect uh, of the way your genes work. So unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are, are reversible and do not change your DNA sequence. That's very important. You know, when people want to say, well, epigenetics is part of neo-Darwinism, no, it's not, because neo-Darwinism requires a mutation and, and, pot, and natural selection. Epigenetics does not have a mutation that changes the DNA. Uh, but it's how you read the DNA, just like you remember back in the analogy. This one slide really pretty much sums up the differences between the theory of evolution or the modern synthesis or neo-Darwinism, they're all used interchangeably. Uh, on the far left, you see a star, which is a mutation and the DNA sequence changes. And that changes the phenotype or the body or shape that comes out. On the right, epigenetics, on the other hand, puts a tag on top of the DNA, either in the form of DNA methylization, which we'll talk about, uh, or there's non-coding RNA that interacts with it, or histones, which we'll talk about. This changes the phenotype. And th by the way, this occurs much faster on an order of 10, uh, 100,000 times as fast as the mutation occurs. And I'm gonna put a little, whoops. Uh, can you turn uh, the sound on for me? Hello? Okay, I turned on. Uh, you, you got it turned on? Yeah. Okay. Tell me if you don't hear this. I don't. We don't hear anything. You don't? Oh. Okay, let me see. I think it's on this. Uh, I think you have to go on your share, on your share your screen and uh, I got share it here. It yeah, I wasn't sure if you could do that. Uh, Science in school. Did okay. you hear that? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's good. Okay. Generation Genius. There are
over 100,000 skin cells in one square centimeter of skin. Each of these cells contain close to two meters of DNA, which contain our genetic information. All the genetic material in our body is called a genome. Because our DNA is very long, cells package up their DNA together with proteins known as histones. The DNA and protein complex is known as chromatin. DNA is wrapped around histone proteins, forming repeated units of nucleosomes that look like beads on a string. Chromatin is condensed further to form a chromosome. We have 46 chromosomes in total, stored in the nucleus. The core of one nucleosome is composed of DNA wrapped around a histone octoma that consists of two copies of the major types of histones, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. This organized DNA protein complex allows the cells to regulate what genes are expressed and when. All the cells in our body contain the same DNA sequence. Skin cells, muscle cells, and liver cells contain the same DNA sequence. Yet all these cells have different structures and functions. The reason is that different cells only use or express certain genes. Within each cell, the DNA and also the histones can be tagged by tiny chemicals that modify gene expression. These chemical tags cause some genes to be turned on and some genes turned off. For example, muscle cells will have genes turned on that a muscle cell requires and will turn off genes that a liver cell requires. I'm going to pause this here just for a second because this goes back to the analogy of the plans and the builders. Uh, and the same thing, all the cells in the body, and there's about 200 different types of cells, have the same plans, the DNA, but it's the epigenetics that plays it to make a liver act like a liver and, and et cetera. So this, this goes right back to the, the very thing. Similarly, the liver cell will have genes for muscles turned off and genes that a liver requires turned on. These modifications are known as epigenetic modifications. Epi is Greek for above, above the genes, so modifications above the genes or on the genes. Epigenetic modification brings about lasting changes in gene expression. Let's have a closer look. Here is a normal human cell, and we are pulling out its genetic material. The DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes, which are made up of histone proteins. Coming off the histone proteins, we have histone tails. DNA is made up of a combination of four nucleotides, G for guanine, C for cytosine, A for adenine, and T for thymine. There are two main epigenetic modifications. The first one we will talk about is DNA methylation where a methyl group is added directly to a cytosine residue that exists in a cytosine guanine sequence, or CPG sequence for short. So for example, here we have many CPG sites that make up a CPG islet. And here, the cytosine are methylated. The methylation of CPG sites in promoter regions is associated with gene silencing. The second type of epigenetic modification is histone modifications. This is where acetyl or methyl groups are directly added onto histone tails, and this will modify gene expression. For example, histone 3K9 acetylation correlates with transcription activation, and histone 3K27 trimethylation with transcription repression. Genome-wide patterns of DNA and histone modifications, or epigenome, are established during early development and are maintained during cell division. In cancer, these patterns are altered and disrupted. Grammarly Go is the only generative AI product that you need. It's easy to use in the places you write. With one download, you get the power of Okay. Um, 
I like that little clip. It's been around for almost seven years. It's still very uh, succinct and uh, applicable today. I mentioned earlier to you that, uh, hearing a little bit of echo, uh, I mentioned, is that me? Uh, I mentioned earlier that researchers estimate that epigenetic changes can be uh, up to 100,000 times faster than genetic mutation rates. So th this means that things can occur very quickly within a generation. You know, if we, if we depend upon neo-Darwinism and random mutations, it would literally take generations to cause any change at all. So it, it's, it really is a mechanism that is, uh, is very want, wanting. This is just kind of something I threw in there for entertainment, if you will, but they've discovered on the right-hand panel that as we grow older, our epigenetic tags uh, change and it's involved with our aging. Epigenetics causes our aging. Um, and this is kind of interesting because if you look in the garden, Adam and Eve tried to go back to the tree of lives. There's no reason, they probably ate from it from the very beginning. Uh, and the reason I say that is they may have lived thousands of years and they ate that tree. Eve was very curious, obviously, and she would have eaten it. Uh, but when they were taken out of the garden, they couldn't go back because they would have continued to live indefinitely if they had access to it. it that tree may have had effect on epigenetics. It, recall that man was not made perfect, but very good. And so there was probably epigenetic errors that occurred and this tree would preserve that. Now, in, in the picture, you see an, a cherubim with four wings and also a sword that, that turns in every direction. And I've always wondered why a cherubim? I mean, why not just a regular angel? Any regular angel with his two arms tied behind his back could stop them from coming back in. It's a cherubim, in my opinion, because he, he's there to stop another cherubim who we know is Lucifer. So, and uh, if it was just going to be one, two chairmen fighting, that would not be, it would just be a tied match at best. Maybe Lucifer could get his leg up on him. But this guy's got this special sword given to him by God that, that you know, it must be big wampum, like a nuke or something. <laughs> so that raises the question, did Lucifer want mankind to live indefinitely in a state of sin? Um, and uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it is a curious question. Oh, going back to that, actually, if you think about it, uh, in the tribulation, when God's knowledge fulfills the world, obviously, uh, epigenetics will be fully explained and aging will be stopped either by, you know, God or, or some, you know, medical pill or something. But man will be in a, in, in a sinful nature and for a thousand years and the number of people that are born are going to be Methusian. Um, and it says that uh, when Satan is re released from uh, a, a pit after a thousand years, that he will gather uh, these people together to attack Jerusalem. And they're, and it's list, they're listed as the sands of the ocean, which is huge. So there's going to be a huge number of believers, but there's also going to be a huge number of unbelievers. And, and what's so really strange about that is it's not that they're unbelievers of God. They know that there's a God. They just reject them and everything about them. So anyway, back to our lesson. For Darwin to work, you have to have a mutation, which is passed on. It has to be in the seed, the egg or the sperm, basically. Um, therefore, anything that happens in your lifetime, like a, a stress event or something else, you were in war, uh, uh, cannot be passed on. In epigenetics, however, allows life's experience to be passed on in what's called soft inheritance, i.e. epigenetics. What's interesting is they are typically passed to the third and the fourth generation. As they studied animal models like mice and other things, they studied that the great-great-grandkids were, were demonstrating the, these tendencies, um, which, which comes back to this Bible verse in Exodus 40, right before he goes into the Ten Commandments. Uh, he said, uh, you know, if you hate me, uh, I will visit the sins of the father to the children on the third and the fourth generations. And the scientists started noticing this, not because they were religious, but they said it's a remarkable prediction of the way things really are occurring. 
And Nature Journal, again, came out with an article called Epigenetics, the Sins of the Father. Of course, this probably made a lot of scientists blow a stroke because they basically linking epigenetics to the Bible, which is rather interesting, isn't it? That, you know, the only, you know, the, this, this field, uh, um, this Bible verse for years, nobody really understood it, what it meant. And now suddenly it's making sense because it, it's explained by epigenetics. So with epigenetics, the organism has the, uh, uh, has the mechanisms to adapt, not evolve, to the environment largely without changes to the DNA letters. So for 60 years, Darwin has felt that DNA mutations with natural selection caused evolution, but epigenetics mainly works without mutations. Uh, even though epigenetics works without mutations, there are still some mutations that occur. However, epigenetics controls them as well. They're not random per evolution. This, this article came out, and I'm actually writing up a blog on it as we speak with RTB. This is a nuclear bomb. Again, Nature Journal. Um, and it, there's two articles. This was one of them. It says, why, uh, why mutation is not as random as we thought. To say that is to be to blow the top off of everybody's Darwinian brain because we're, we're completely dead. They were completely dedicated to random mutations. And this is saying, hey, wait a minute. It's not random like we thought. And this is part of this article. It says, since the first half of the 20th century, evolutionary theory has been dominated by the idea that mutations occur random with, with respect to their consequences. We conclude that epigenetic mutational bias, okay, what that means is that epigenetic mechanisms makes the mutations biased towards a certain way, which, so it's not random, challenges this prevailing uh, paradigm the mutation is a directionless force. I mean, that directionless force is the heart and soul of neo-Darwinism. You know, he was conclaimed, we're just, we're just meat sacks and uh, there's no purpose in the universe. So this, on the other hand, challenges that whole stand. So our discovery yields a new account of the forces driving the patterns of natural variation. Notice it uses natural variation, not natural selection. Challenging a long-standing paradigm, paradigm regarding the randomness of mutation. Those two slides are nuclear. I mean, if I had them back when I was in school in the 70s, I mean, I could have just... Uh, easily just waxed any professor who tried to say that, you know, these things were random. And so we're going back to Conrad Waddington, who made that statement to Nature Journal the same year that evolutionary theory came out proposing random mutations. And he said, I doubt that anyone is going to be satisfied just chasing these random mutations as though that causes anything. Uh, so 90 years to the day almost, um, you know, he was right. So instead of random mutations, we have loaded or biased, diced, if you will. And so you see the random mutation in orange over there, but the dice is no longer random, but it's biased. It's like the dice has been set to where it's only going to roll double sixes. For 140 years, the majority of evolutionists philosophically preferred the implication of directionless force in nature as first proposed by Darwin. And this is because they're, they, are, they have a... Uh, if this is the case, then they're not uh, responsible to God or anything because we're, we're just meat sacks. This is a, uh, this current return of the organism and the recent calls for a genteel perspective. And what this is saying is that epigenetics is saying that it's not at the DNA level, it's at the agent level or the cellular organism. Uh, that's what's important, not how DNA specifically mutates this way or that way, uh, but there's all this overlay on it with, that's caused by epigenetics. So they point out that we do, we have to start to re rethink uh, concerning this side of Kant's legacy, Immanuel Kant, teleology, and this is talking about teleology in the organism and uh, Kant's controversial legacy for contemporary biology. In other words, teleology is back on the table. Teleology is the doctrine of design and purpose in the material world. So we can now say that uh, the dolphin has flippers uh, 
because it needed them. Uh, and the same, but even though the dolphin had these flippers, uh, uh, birds had wings because they needed them. It's a design principle, but there's no genetics that connects the two. It's totally different DNA. Uh, but epigenetics guides the formation of these particular structures, and they uh, they occur over and over through history. Now I'm going to take a little step over and talk about codon usage bias because uh, codons also do away with random mutations. We have specific codons that the body makes, and I'll describe this in a second. Uh, it refers to the difference of frequency of synonymous codons in DNA. I'm sure you didn't remember synonymous, so I'll explain it in a second. A codon is a series of three nucleotides that encodes a specific amino acid residue in a polypeptide chain or the terminal of uh, translation. And here's the codons you see in the, the middle line, uh, three amino acid, uh, three nucleotides are on the uh, RNA co uh, code for a particular amino acid. Uh, however, what's fascinating when we start to study this, and uh, let me see if arginine, no, arginine is not mentioned back there. Uh, arginine is one of the amino acids that can get coded for in the codons. And look at the different codons that can code for arginine. There's one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Notice the letters. The first two have uh, AGA and AGC, uh, and then you have CG, and then down below it's CG, again, CG, CG. Notice the predominances of C and G. That's because the Cs and Gs, the C in particular, involved with epigenetics. And there's a bias of these codons. We're not getting a random setup of codons. So going back to Francis Crick, when he said it was just a frozen accident, it's not a frozen accident. They, are, they have a tendency towards being biased towards Gs and Cs because the Gs and Cs wound up making uh, are, are involved with epigenetics. So it, it, uh, the vast majority of these codons are not just randomly made. If neo-Darwinism is correct, you should just have random codons, but instead we have this codon bias. And uh, in this article, it said these regions of codon bias, far from contributing to human adaptation, which is natural selection, represents the Achilles heel of our genome. <laughs> in other words, natural selection, you can't find in the DNA. Uh, the codon bias blows it up. These biologists, um, uh, as kind of a sidestep to that, the evolutionary biologists have long debated whether, uh, and this was done actually by, uh, Stephen Gould, he said, if you rewound the tape of life, it should completely come out utterly different each time. However, these guys are saying, uh, uh, if you rewind the tape of life and replay it, it would give similar results or whatever the outcomes depend on largely uh, on chance and ev uh, events that push the course of evolution into radically different tracks. The, the tape of life may not be taken randomly. Uh, in other words, it's gonna come out with the same things. And this has to do with epigenetics and the way it causes development. Uh, so uh, um, in, in other words, have you ever wondered why when you look at a pig and a human being, why isn't there, why isn't there a partial pig human being? Well, we, actually there are some. Are, are a, a pig and a cat, why isn't there a pig cat running around? We should see a numerous series of intermediaries between one animal and another, but it's not because the way epigenetics guides the usage of the DNA to only make certain rooms with certain paint colors, and it's not going to make it all, it's not going to throw the paint on the wall and come up with brown every time. So the ultimate cause of these patterns is not natural selection but rather a strong phenotype or body bias in the RNA genotype phenotype map, a type of developmental bias or findability constraint, if you will, which limits evolutionary dynamics to a, huge, to a hugely reduced, reduced subset of structures that are easy to find. So this is the article is this phenotype bias determines how natural 
RNA sequences occupy the morphospace of all possible shapes. The morphospace is how the, um, what I was basically talking to you about, the morphology of these different spaces uh, go a certain different direction. And, um, and this, is really, this is really huge. We had no idea about these sort of things when I was in college. Uh, we, we just thought that a mutation would cause a different form and, and then it would happen. But, but we were not recognizing the fact that flippers were us, that dolphins were having flippers and birds were having wings and bees were having wings. And, and all these things had different genetics for, forming the same morphospace, if you will. Um, but it's through, it's through epigenetic uh, shaping uh, that causes this. So this is a slide. Uh, in the top part of the slide, it compares the amount of DNA similarities between humans and chimps. For instance, it's 98%. Now this is not entirely true because this is only talking about the 2% coding DNA or exonic DNA. Yeah, we are 98% similar. However, we have uh, out of about 2%, there's another 98% called junk DNA and it's very different, okay? Uh, nevertheless, even if we just take the coding uh, proteins and compare them, we're we're not we're 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 only uh, ninety percent different than a cat. A cow is eighty percent. Chicken is sixty percent. A mouse is eighty, uh, and a platypus is eighty-two percent. Um, and a fish now the bottom is seventy-one. This means that we have, uh, if you go back to that first analogy, the plans that were given to those guys. Um, about 60% of it is the same for whatever kind of house they might build down the street. But they're given <clears throat> another bits of those plans and the epigenetics can build diff very different looking houses with those things. So really the issue in the, and so uh, all the evolutionists were comparing the DNA and they were sticking their finger in the thumbs of people that didn't, didn't believe in what they were teaching and said, ah, we're 98% the same as a chimp, that, that proves evolution. It absolutely doesn't. And the reason is it's not comparative, comparative genetics that counts, it's comparative epigenetics. And that's the lower bar, uh, 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 part of the slide there. Comparative epigenetics shows the methyl pattern difference between those three animals there. And that's what makes the difference. So, and I'll show this in, in a slide here. So here's your epigenetic mechanism, and it can put a tags on top of the DNA to make all kinds of different shapes that you see popping up. And uh, again, there's different types of tags, and they can make scales and, and all kinds of uh, different looking things. And here's applied uh, to that uh, uh, slide just a couple back that compares the amount of DNA. Well, what about the fact that ant casts uh, have uh, this is a unique model uh, uh, epigenetics because ant cats have the same DNA and they give rise to completely different phenotypes the soldiers, common laborers, and queens. Uh, and when they started, and the same sort of study uh, sh showed that honeybees are the same way. This is uh, Lamarckian epigenetics um, in determining the, uh, the cast development and behavior. So look here, we have this, all these ants are the same DNA. You have a minor ant, a soldier, and a queen. Uh, and Conrad Wyington developed this diagram back in 1940 to describe what epigenetics can cause to happen. It's like a ball rolling down the hill. It may go down one tunnel or it may go another, but it's, the groove will tend to form uh, the way it finally goes. And on the left-hand side, you see that it goes towards a minor. In the middle is a soldier. On the far right, it goes towards a queen as, it, as the epigenetic development comes out. So, you know, if you'd buried these in the, uh, in the dirt and they fossilized a million years ago and you pulled them out, they would say that these are different species of, of animals. And they're not, they have identical DNA. This is also why paleontology is, is really in trouble because paleontology can't study the DNA past much past a million years, uh, just barely a million years. So how can they really say something is quote unquote related 
Uh, and then you can, you know, you're always seeing these things showing some gecko or something in, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, amber or something, and it's 100 million years old. It looks identical to the ones we have today. And this is because that morphospacing thing, they developed according along an epigenetic path, like one of these roots, and, and came out exactly the same, and they stayed the same way over 100 million years. It, this explains that gradualism and, and Darwin's mutations does not work. Okay, this same thing, this same concept was applied to Darwin's finches, studying the epigenetics to see what was going on. Uh, you know, before in the previous slide, you know, you're dealing with the same genes epigenetically, but in, in this group, you have slightly different genes, but the biggest amount of change was in their epigenes, and that's what caused the difference in the beaks. So, uh, you know, again, the Darwin's finches are the, that's the Darwin of neo-Darwinism, uh, Darwin, excuse me, Darwinism. He was on the Beagle, he went to the Galapagos Islands. You know, his whole theory based is based off of this more than any one uh, plant or organism. Uh, and, and then the neo-Darwinists picked up Darwinism and said, well, it was due to mutations. And there's, there's literally 19,000 articles out there on people trying to show that as being the case. But then this guy here comes along and blows that all out of the water. He studied the epigenetics uh, between the different closely related species. And he noticed that, uh, that the epigenetic changes guides the molecular basis of evolution of Darwin's finches, not the genetic changes. So that really was uh, you know, huge uh, because they were trying to show that you know, little bit, bitty changes in the, uh, in the DNA can cause this to occur. You know, another, uh, another icon of evolution is the peppered moth, which you've which we all studied, I don't know whether it's high school or college, but supposedly this is explained by a mutation occurring and uh, it was a positive mutation which changed. Well, the problem was, is this occurred in the, 19, in the 18, late 1800s in a very narrow period of time. Evolution would have taken hundreds of thousands of years to cause that and it had no idea that the industrial evolution was coming across. What happened was a piece of junk DNA popped into the gene and changed the, the color. So it had nothing, which has nothing to do with neo-Darwinism. Junk DNA is something they've already rejected, but the junk DNA changed the color. And subsequently, uh, the, uh, because it became darker, it, was, it survived, not survival of the fittest, but it survived anyway. And suddenly there was more of uh, dark uh, moss hanging around. So we're learning more and more about epigenetics. The icons of, uh, of uh, evolution in Darwin are falling one by one. Um, I want to take a step back to the central dogma, which I told you about. On the far left, this is what I was taught in college and believed, by the way, uh, but it only applied to the 2%. They really didn't talk about that. Uh, but on the right, you can see that there's non-coding regions and introns in between those coding regions, and those are called the junk DNA, and they make up 98%, like in the case of the chimps. You know, on the right, they're saying 98% of the 2%, and that's not a fair uh, comparison. Uh, when you look at the 98% uh, in between the 2%, it's the junk DNA, and ours differ vastly from chimpanzees, especially in, in brains, in the brain parts. Uh, so, but this is non-coding RNA and it guides and works with epigenetics. It's part of the epigenetic mechanism. This is Barbara McClintock. Uh, she, here she is, poor thing, at 83 years of age, receiving the Nobel Prize. What is sad about this is back in the 40s when, when Waddington, you know, was was promoting his stuff. She was studying corn. Have you have you ever, you've seen the old corn in a basket? You know, the the old corns that have different color uh, kernels. Well, she was wondering why different color kernels. They're all the same genetically. Why should there be different colors? And when she just what she discovered was that the the little chunks of the DNA were jumping around to cause different colors. Uh, and, and they responded accordingly to stress. And she called this the jumping genes, which basically is junk DNA. 
So she proved it, but everyone called her crazy. And she eventually quit research as a result of this, only to be recognized as a, as a genius. And now everyone claims her as their own, even the evolutionists. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick uh, talk on junk DNA. In 2001, researchers of the Human Genome Project determined that only 2% of human DNA are genes, the sequences that directly code for the proteins our cells use to carry out their functions. The remaining 98% of the genome was concluded to be a biological wasteland. But it turns out that this supposed junk DNA is crucial for controlling gene activity, often acting as switches to turn genes on and off. These switches determine where and when a gene turns on. When a regulatory molecule binds with its corresponding switch on the DNA, it will cause the switch to flip and the gene to be activated. With the regulatory molecule bound to the switch, the gene will be expressed in greater amounts. When the regulatory molecule detaches from its switch, gene expression will stop. Typically, the gene will be surrounded by many switches that allow the gene to be turned on and off under the control of different regulatory molecules. So, in this case, uh, basically the same thing happened with the uh, this, the uh, peppered moth, a piece of junk DNA got in front of the part that coded for color or, or non-color, and it turned the DNA so that it would uh, not code for, uh, it would code for darkness. And they had no clue to that was what was going on, but that nevertheless is what occurred. You say. Trying to get this to large again. Maybe you can help me. I'm having trouble enlarging this. Well, we'll we'll trot on at this. Don't worry about it. It's big enough that we can see it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So. Uh, uh, this is in response, basically, to the Human Genome Project. And Francis Collins, who's a Christian theistic evolutionist, believed that neo-Darwinism was correct and that 98% of the DNA was junk. And he ignored it. And uh, after over an 11-year project was $7 billion, and it basically just uh, blew apart. It really didn't produce anything because he ignored everything. He later on came out and said it was hubris to think that we could ignore this. Well, that's great, but... Uh, so ONCODE is a, is a project that involved uh, um, 400 labs and thousands of investigators where they studied the 98%. And they said that uh, over 80% of this was functional. Um, they also said that the rest of the DNA was within just a few hundred KB of the functional parts, which really implied that all of the DNA is functional. Well, this created a huge firestone storm. However, they have 13,000 citations and 9,000 people, 9,000 researchers have used their encyclopedia of knowledge. You, you know, they're, you know, basically science is announcing it here that they, they've Ancode wrote the eulogy for junk DNA. Um, so, but 
but you would have you would have thought that um, evolutionary people would have been happy for some new information, but no, they protested violently and wrote really bad articles about them. Now, what's interesting is in medicine, you know, in medicine, which I'm in, you know, we're being told to ignore this junk DNA all this time. Um, and I was told when I was in medical school that it was. So, uh, and we've, so we're sitting on the sideline trying to figure out why isn't it that the, that the coding DNA really isn't coming up with much. Uh, there, there's a few things that explains uh, like uh, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, but those are monogenetic illnesses where they were just a small piece of the DNA completely controlled everything. But things like heart disease and others had several different genes involved and you, you couldn't get any information. And the reason was, is we were ignoring the junk DNA. We now know that in the junk DNA, there's all sorts of things that are involved with heart disease. Um, and uh, and the, this, uh, the, this medical researcher says this so-called junk DNA plays a critical role in mammalian development. So, you know, the medical researchers are, what I like about medical researchers is they're not guided by doctrine per se. So they'll just call it as it is. And this is, you know, this almost would have been uh, anathema to say at any other time. Also cancer is the second, second leading cause of death next to heart disease. And it's completely an epigenetic issue. Um, and, uh, you know, I was telling you all the 130,000 articles on epigenetics, those were from PubMed, and most of them are about cancer and other things. This is an article written by Dennis Noble. Uh, Dennis Noble is uh, a, a physiologist that's just, if you look at his resume, it's unbelievable. He's, he's been cited over 30,000 times for all his articles over the years, but he tells it like it is, and people hate him for telling it like it is. And uh, one of the things that he said with neodonin's replacement by epigenetics, teleology design is back on the table. And he named this article, was the watchmaker blind or was she one-eyed? And that's really kind of poking fun at uh, Dawkins' blind watchmaker book. So there we have it. Uh, rather than putting genetics in the middle word, and epigenetics really is the middle word, and the gene is up a, a couple lines up as a small portion of it, it's just a toolkit, and epigenetics drives it all. So, and you have all sorts of other things like histones, microRNAs, biochemistry, chromosomes, et cetera, uh, making up the full picture. If you're interested in following me along, I have a Facebook group called Darwin versus Lamarck, and I publish a lot of my blogs, which I, I do extensive amount of blogs. Um, and uh, so the, the, it's amazing what uh, Google Bard artificial intelligence can help you come up with because it, you can craft things in there and, and as, as long as you know what's right, what's wrong, it can really help. Uh, uh, come up with some things. In fact, that was, I mentioned that illustration at the very beginning. So join in with us uh, on Facebook and I'll take some questions. Fine, we're gonna take a short break and then we're gonna uh, okay. pass it, okay? All right. I'm in a break. <laughs> So if anybody wants to get some uh, coffee or something in the back, they got yours. It's a, it's a bit complicated. No, it's not complicated. Okay. It's a little repetitive. Okay. I just, uh, so do we get to ask him questions yes. or do we ask you questions? We'll ask him. Yeah, because uh, okay. I understand the biochemistry. I just trying to figure out how it relates to. All right. God. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Genesis. 
the objectives we have not to do to see a weird help. Thank very much. Love is to my church. Not really, no. And you live with your I heard the ankle project finally that I would have thought it was bad at six months. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He did once, but it's sort of part of well, you know, it's something that can have a certain appearance until you zoom in and look close. So that two percent difference between eight percent and man, of course, if you're seven, like they most creatures kind of give off that's why that's why that's yeah. When you start going on, two percent the evolution of this planet that's showing in the end was left on the residual star the way in the gospel. As he has to do a book, you think that's more yeah just this is this is like a bit of a very good yeah yeah Not necessarily the DNA but actually it's how the DNA sequence is either transcribed or translated into the word. Transcribed to the word. Outcomes are for the patient or the general outcome, right? So, and then that real or generation. I like this analogy. He gets out of the text. I saw on the river. As I help him to understand what he's talking about, uh -huh. that the river can change the plan. Yeah. To me, how does that really change? You hear me? Okay, well, I'm going to. Philip and they have commotion. You talked about. Uh, are you there? Yes, I can. I have one question. Uh, question. Uh, you talked about how uh, you know the Bible verse of uh, the sins of the father being passed on to the third and fourth generation. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. People are talking over each other. Uh, you're either going to have to mute everybody or tell everyone to listen. <laughs> Let's see here. Hold on. Uh, There's still somebody talking. I can't hear you. Maybe it was me. It's, All right, well, it's, my, my microphone was actually conflicting with the Zoom. <laughs> okay, I, I hear you now. Yeah. No, I, I was just only saying you're direct. Holy cow. Got a lot of background noise. Um, I was letting you know that I, I sent you an invite on uh, LinkedIn. Oh, just now? A little while ago. I'm sorry. I think I rejected it. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I didn't very, really very, know. very, very polite. I'm teasing. <laughs> no, I mean, I get, I get a lot of people who are just basically wanting to sell me something. Um, that wouldn't that wouldn't be me. <laughs> no, I understand that. Uh, well, well, okay, maybe you can try it again or something, or send me a link. Yeah, I'll send you the link. I, I still have it my end pending, but uh, let me link me my give me my link so that we then you can actually do the uh, direct connection to me. 
Yeah, by the way, uh, if anyone's interested, I do post my blog on LinkedIn as well, if you want nice. to. Yeah, yeah. So either you can get it at Darwin versus Lamarck or that, uh, or you can go directly to the blog spot at Lamarckian blog, Lamarckian blog spot dot org. Um, and just check the uh, chat and in in uh, Zoom, and you'll okay. see a direct link that I sent you there. Okay. In in Zoom. Oh, yeah, okay. Zoom's, Zoom's chat. Yeah. Okay. Last question, Bruno. Yeah. So, uh, my question is: Do you have any examples of epigenetics working in human to people? Oh yeah, big time. Uh, the first one, uh, the first occurrence of this, by the way, uh, you know, Denmark, for instance, they they are very good. Their doctors are excellent, and they're really good at recording records. And you know, Denmark got taken over by the Nazis, right? So they started studying. The, the the exact weight when a woman got pregnant, the weight she was, because certain people in Denmark were targeted by the Nazis, um, and uh, and they started uh, following this, and that's been, you know, what sixty years, uh, seventy years at this point, and they they noticed that this three generational change was occurring in them. That is the first example of that occurring in humans. Uh, I mean, it's easy to do a study like this in, in hamsters because they mate real fast and, and die fast, but it's hard to do in humans. But that's that's the most significant one. They were they were discovering, for instance, a woman that uh, in Denmark who who commiserated with the Nazis and got an extra food ration that her children uh, were born at a normal weight and had fewer uh, uh psychopathies or, or physical illnesses. The women that resisted the Nazis who were given fewer amounts of food uh, and, their, and their children would be born underweight, they would have more uh, schizophrenia and more health problems. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating that, that that is the case. That's the only real good human case because of the length of time. Uh, now we can do several studies tracking the epigenetics of humans and they have been doing that as well um and yeah these these things are, uh these things are holding up in fact uh i in that article that i'm submitting to um rtb it deals with the uh non-randomness of mutations that's occurring in human beings not just in plants and other things but it's actually in human beings as well that was a real good question Thank you, Derek. We have uh, somebody here who wants to ask a question. Uh, I just have a, a, a quick question. Uh, from my understanding of what you explained in epigenetics is that uh, uh, it's environmental forces that causes not necessarily the change in the DNA, but uh, how the DNA is either transcribed or translated. So instead of- That's correct. You That's correct. Answer? Yeah, and that's different than the environmental uses per neo-Darwinism. So, so what you're saying is that you're, there, there is a, a, a change in the phenotype that's being uh, uh, elicited either in the third or fourth generation. Uh, but my question is twofold. One is, how does that relate to the theory of intelligent design where God supposedly, versus evolution, where God supposedly created individual species unrelated on Earth, either during the Jurassic period, the pre cambrian period, whatever. Does epigenetic actually relate to the, the whole process of intelligent design? Now, the, the second question is, you said, it doesn't really, Epigenetics has not really changed the genetics through mutations. If that's the case, you, you've got little environmental changes within a generation. When that phenotype or whatever happens is passed on in the third or fourth generation, 
Is that not considered a genetic mutation? See, you see my, well, my and that second question is the question that everybody has. Uh, how uh, how is that assimilated to cause a full genetic change, or does it need to be that way? They're they're saying you know, and a lot of the neodarwinists are saying, well, you know, fine, you have three to four generations of epigenetic changes, but that's not really evolution because it's not really changing the DNA. Um, but there are a lot of different things that can change beyond this. For instance, uh, prions, which are proteins. Uh, can cause a protein to protein inheritance. And they're discovering that prions can cause protein changes for thousands of generations. So this may be, we're dealing with non-genetic inheritance uh, in a way we've never thought about. Um, so, um, you know, we're, 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 try, we're stuck in the framework of thinking unless it's the DNA changes, the other doesn't change. The other thing that we're really not thinking about is the fact that you've got junk DNA, which jumps all over the place. How does it affect those permanent changes? You know, did, did bits of DNA jump? And that's what caused these changes, What sure did in, in the case of the spotted uh, owl, uh, moss, you know, and, uh, but will it create whole new uh, species? Well, that's a lot, a lot of people think that that might occur, but of course we haven't really demonstrated that fully. Uh, going back to your first question, can you, can you restate that again? Well, like the whole theory of, of uh, intelligent design of, of, of species versus evolution is that supposedly God went and created, let's say, the dinosaur or the leopard or whatever as individual species, that, and there is not, uh, there isn't that, uh, that, that transitional link that's in the fossil record that he just sort of like, poof, and there was that species. So how does your theory of epigenetics relate to creation? Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of speciation as well. Uh, now, the epigenetic mechanisms that you saw that guy drawing, you know, uh, you know, he was drawing the little different methanes, uh, methyl groups, et cetera. Every bit of that machinery goes back to the very beginning. When they do follow genetic studies, They've, they've discovered that the epigenetic mechanisms are at the very beginning of life. Now, this beginning of life is not a Darwinian tree of life. It's a, it's a bush or branches of life where everything suddenly originates uh, all, all at once. And epigenetics is there at the same time as viruses arose, is the same time as DNA me uh, replicating mechanisms. Um, so all they know is it's there at the very beginning and they're working together. Uh, so it's not like DNA came along and then epigenetics evolved. That's not the case. You know, it, it was there. Uh, now, how does this relate to like intelligent design? You know, I actually took a slide out because I was trying to short this talk, but the slide talked about Psalms 104 and how, um, which according to RTB model is that, you know, uh, God can withhold things and the animals die and the Holy Spirit goes back out and repopulates the land. And Hugh Ross talks about those as being extinction events. Um, and uh, so it's possible that the Holy Spirit used epigenetics to cause that because epigenetics can shape things dramatically. But it wasn't just pure genetic. Uh, it, it probably also included uh, the jumping genes that... Uh, um, that Barbara McClintock talked about, and that make up, by the way, over 50% of our DNA. So I think there's a million of different things in there. Uh, um, the question I, I'm not able to really figure out is, did God just make it all this way so complex that it, it just kind of unfolded in a natural format, or does he put his finger in the machinery every so often? Uh, and I, I don't really understand. I don't know. <laughs> it, seemed, <laughs> it seems like things are too complex not to for him to have done that. Um, but uh, as far as what biologists are talking about, uh, you're, you're familiar with Frank, uh, Stephen J. Gould's punctuate equilibrium. Uh, model. Uh, he was, and he, he which he said uh, basically uh, invalidated neo-Darwinism and, and its gradualism. And I think he's correct. And now a lot of 
uh, evolutionary biologists are thinking that maybe jumping genes are used to cause new species in rapid periods of time uh, due to the stress and that epigenetics controls how these jumping genes move around. Uh, that still, there's no nothing to fill in the details there. That's just broad strokes with the brush. So uh, that's as far as what I know. Uno? Anyone else have another question? Yeah, Uno? Yeah, Chris, Chris go ahead. And, you know, you mentioned that 2% of the DNA produces different proteins. Well, if you look at the bones, for example, okay, you know, the proteins can produce the same bone matter as, you know, the bones and the teeth and everything else. But there are tens of thousands of different shapes of bones and teeth. There's all kinds of dimensional things. So are some of the junk DNA responsible for forming the proteins into the shapes yeah. of teeth and bones and all the rest? That, that's exactly correct. Uh, junk DNA uh, for, uh, will code for what's, what's called non-coding RNA. And that non-coding RNA, and there's several different types of it, they, you know, the, the bone is the same for the most part, but how you shape the bone and sculpt the bone is is like watching a sculpture who who takes, you know, like uh, like uh, Da Vinci that takes a, a block of, uh, of granite and, and makes David out of it, you know, so <laughs> it's the same way. They, you know, they, they sculpture this bone into different types of shapes, whether it's spicules or compact bone or other things. Um, and uh, um, which, by the way, you've probably heard the fact that uh, the designer of uh, in Paris of what's what's the thing the the Tower of Paris or whatever you know I'm talking about Eiffel Tower the Eiffel Tower the guy that designed it took a hip bone and cut it in half and saw how the spicules supported everything he copied it to to do the Eiffel Tower so which you know again man copies nature over and over. You know, so, um, but yeah, that, it's all part of the, it's it's how the epigenetics works, because otherwise it could be a heart muscle, or kidney. You know, totally different looking stuff, uh, same DNA. It's and and it's it's like those plans, and you know that analogy I gave at the very beginning at, about the plans. It's it seems like it's really very. That's a very minor analogy. I mean, we're talking. You know, they could make a sky rise out of it with those plants if they wanted to. I mean, they could do some dramatic things. However, uh, because of the interaction of the way the RNA and the non-coding RNA and epigenetics works, there is this tendency to make certain types of shapes, like the fins on a duck pop, uh, porpoise uh, versus the wings on a bird, you know, and, uh, and that's the morphospace concept. And this is something that's very new, um, but it's explaining things now. And it, and it also explains how we went from dinosaurs to, to smaller critters and things. You know, they still had the legs, you know, dinosaurs and the critters had legs. They're different sizes, their mouths and everything else. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it, the morphospace concept continues to work. And that's why we don't have pigmen walking around. Um, uh, our bird cats walking around. Uh, it's it's channeled into a certain direction, and the tape of life would be if replayed would come out the same way. I have a question. Uh, the term junk DNA is very you know derogatory. Is there has anyone come up with another name for that uh, part of the DNA? That's well, yeah, and a lot of um, now that. The term, well, it, it depends on who's, who it's derogatory to. They were making it, uh, the, the neo-Darwinists were making it derogatory towards people like us. But now we're kind of wagging it back in their face. And so oh, we don't want to call it that anymore, you know, kind of like whining. So <laughs> if you want to give them a hard time on Facebook or something, use junk DNA. Here's your junk DNA doing this. But they, now they're saying non-coding DNA, you know. Um, which is still the same thing, but that way it's less derogatory, if you will. So that's that's kind of where it stands. That it's non-coding. And what they will actually, 
Sorry, Brunel. Vaughn, actually, one thing actually you just mentioned earlier between the species of Earth itself, especially the comparison between our winged neighbors we've got, I was even considering the bats, birds, our uh, sea life that actually even has, in a sense, wings or fins, and how they vary itself. But the distinction mm -hmm. has actually got me intrigued to know regarding the separation of those genetic uh, structures, even when you're described regarding like uh, creating an actual sculpture that the, our famous and past artists have created itself. Yet there is still relation, is there not, in some manners, even though like we don't have wings, but we do have tailbones, just not as extended as like the canines or even the felines, right? Well, the term teleology or design gets back into it because in every case that you have something, there is a need for that animal to have a particular shape to either move through the air or move through the water, right? Or move on land. So, and, and subsequently they're gonna have, they have to have a, with, from their body, something that protrudes outwards, which is, is gonna have to move them along. And um, the, uh, in this case, God made things uh, with these epigenetic pan, uh, uh, enablers to develop these things over and over again. So, and they developed it over and over again without genetic similarity. These homeoplasty, homeoplasty and, and homology is, is a real sticking point from neodarmanism. <laughs> How could homeoplastic organs occur when they're completely different from one another? And they couldn't have, they couldn't have just mutated to cause the same things. You know, it's like the eye, you know, has, has uh, come about a hundred different times over age from, from the tri uh, trilobites to our eyes and the, completely DNA different, um, but they came about to do the same things. So that's teleology is, is the need for something and it comes about. And that's, um, that's why it's kind of exciting right now because uh, it, this now has a mechanism. Neo-Darwinism didn't have a mechanism. They have dreams of a mechanism, but nothing else. <laughs> so. Omar, you have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> My question is, um, I can see how epigenetics um, uh, blows neo-Darwinism out of the water, uh, but how do we apply it in an apologetic context uh, for somebody that's... Uh, that says, okay, I believe in epigenetics, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean there's a God. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, although epigenetics does open the door to teleology or design, which is, you know, if there's design and there's reason, um, then that opens the door to God. Um, I would say probably one of the most significant things is looking back at that Nature Journal article, uh, epigenetics or sins of the father. Uh, in other words, the Bible recognized that bad behavior can cause things to your great, great grandkids and therefore don't do these bad things. And the bad things, by the way, are the Ten Commandments. And uh, guess what? Uh, he gave it to the Israelis, Israelites. And when did he give it to them? After they had been 400 years in slavery and all this stuff was in their, in their DNA, this bad epigenetic stuff. So he takes them out in the desert, isolates them from everybody, gives them these strict commands not to do these things, to try to get to straighten them out epigenetically, if you will, so their behaviors would straighten out. Um, he fed them pure foods like manna, which changed things for them as well, and, and dove. Um, and he put, put them in a very strict environment. And uh, But unfortunately, the first generation just was too inundated with this stuff and it had to be their kids that got out of it um, but there's one people group uh in this world that follows the 10, Ten commandments even today and who is that <laughs> you know, it's the jewish people right and they make up 0.2 percent of the population yet they win 20 percent of the nobel prizes so it's not because they accepted or rejected Christ. It's because they're still following the Ten Commandments, in my viewpoint, and uh, and it has positive benefits over generations. So, and these these positive generational effects are to third and fourth generational uh, effects. So, I would say that that's one of them. You know, um, maybe not all of it, but 
Um, and I would say the other thing I do when, when uh, you know, I'm, sometimes I'll get in an atheist group uh, in Facebook and uh, I, I post a, a graphic from Pew, Pew Research that shows that 95% of atheists accept Darwinism, you know, and says, is that true? And then they'll start fighting for that. And then when I show, you know, that, that epigenetics is done away with it, and then they'll usually tend to throw Darwin out of the bus, you know. So it's it's uh, it's it's kind of hard to get them to agree or say exactly what they feel. That they'll argue for Darwin until they realize they can't, and then they'll throw him out of the bus and say, "Well, isn't that great that science has fixed this?" So. But, you know, that, that, that's a question how to handle that. But nevertheless, their theory has fallen to one that's more consistent with scripture. Thanks. Andrew, you have a question? Uh, yeah, this is going to show off my lack of understanding of biology and genetics, but there we go. Uh, we have a backyard that's uh, friendly to birds. And I've seen uh, chickadees and and robins and finches and cardinals. Uh, why don't they? Is there some genetic reason why they don't interbreed and and produce some uh, kind of muck bird? <laughs> well, well, and that again, a lot of it has to do with epigenetics. One more time, and uh, the uh, the formation of the egg and the, and the sperm is what is stopping that there. It's called zygote incompatibility because their genetics is different. Right. Uh, you can, on the other hand, get uh, birds that are closely related to another brand of bird and get a hybrid and then they back uh, cross with that hybrid and then and that's called integration and that can occur but it's it's close species not completely different species um that's really where the battles at to discover what are these mechanisms and how far of it's genetic and how far how much of it's epigenetic and how much how much of it's junk dna and we really don't know there's a lot of speculations on it um it, it does it's interesting to me in the bible however how it lists uh, uh the species especially in, Gen in genesis one and uh you know, that's something that even when I was in college, you know, the professors couldn't explain from a Darwinian standpoint. You know, why do we have these species according to their own kind, you know? And uh, I mean, they always wanted to come up with articles that said that, that, you know, speciation is commonly seen and it's not really, you know, it's introgression, which is not speciation really. Uh, so um, um, that's, so there, but nevertheless, oh, the other thing too, for instance, if you look at a human uh, female's egg and you've seen the pictures where the sperm's trying to get inside the egg, that lock mechanism is like, is more complex than any kind of encrypted VPN or anything your computer could do. It has to be an exact mechanism by which it matches the key on that sperm, on that female's egg for that sperm to be pulled in. It's not just a matter of any random sperm ramming in. Otherwise, you you know, the woman can have any kind of sperm. So it's got that specific thing. And then once that goes in there, it's almost like a safe, you know, where, where you turn the door and things pop out. This, this thing called the zona pellucida breaks loose and pushes all other sperm away when that one sperm comes in. And then, and then it sheds itself uh, uh, of its tail and me mechanism and, and this other stuff. I mean, it's incredibly uh, precise and accurate. And how could that occur um, in any two, uh, any two different, you know, species? And that's something they've not explained. That that might be the reason the Holy Spirit gets involved in uh, uh, Psalms 104. You know, He comes in. He, it recreates that and part of that is the zygote barrier, you know, so he makes a new animal or shapes everything newly, you know, that seems to be the most reasonable thing to do, but it's, it's kind of nonsense scientific to say that because you're automatically ignoring the possibility that you're going to find a scientific explanation for this. So for that reason, I don't, I don't automatically dismiss it, but I, I do find it 
things like that, you know, you know, really complex. Okay, so what you just said then, like there is some claim that uh, Neanderthals made it with humans. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think, and the reason is they're pretty similar, gen genetically similar. And I think that that data is pretty, pretty sound. And it depends on where you are. If you're up northern, uh, like in uh, England and France, there's there's more similarity. But we're talking about the similarity of DNA is like 0.04%. So it's a very small amount of similarity. Uh, However, there's a gentleman that won uh, a Nobel last year on studying Neanderthal, and guess what he studied? He studied the epigenetics, and they discovered of the DNA that we share with Neanderthal, there was about a 60% difference in the epigenetics of the Hox genes. Hox genes are the genes that give you your body plan, you know, like two arms, two legs, uh, you look at all these animals, we all have hox genes. Even snakes have hox genes uh, that make that makes us bilaterals. You know, you can draw a line down the middle of us and we're pretty much the same on both sides. So what he discovered, though, was there was a dramatic difference in the hox genes. And this would explain why it is that the Neanderthal has a real big rugged brow, you know, of, of bone and that they're muscularly much bigger and, and these things, because that's the Hox genes. So, um, so that was, what this is going to cause is a new field of paleoepigenetics, you know, the first time to be able to discover what things were related and how they're epigenetically related. And um, the, the old stuff is gone, really. You can't just say that that these two species are related by the number of genes that they contain. That's not what, you know, it has to be what the epigenetics is doing at the same time. So, yeah. Can I just uh, ask a quick question? Uh, just to follow up on what Andrew said, uh, this is going to sound strange, but you said the two birds may not be able to mate with each other. So uh, let's say in, in your backyard, a robin, you know what a robin looks like, right? Orange breast. Yes. And then, and then, so then when we look in the mirror, we can see ourselves in the mirror. When a robin looks at another bird, let's say a red cardinal, mm -hmm. how does he recognize that that's not his species and it won't work if he mates with the red cardinal? You see my point? Yeah, I do. That's one question. The other question is Bruno mentioned. He asked, are there any evidence of epigenetics in humans? And there's not been a lot. So then does epigenetics, if, it, if it's going to affect our Earth on a grander scale, does it take one time, which we don't have a lot in the last 200 years, we've never changed into a chimp. You just said before the 2% between a chimp and and a human are, are, are the way those two percent encodes differently. Uh, so we've never seen humans turning into a chip. So does epigenetics, if it happens on a grand scale, does it take uh, an immense amount of time, which we may not have in, in, in our future, or, or does it take, let's say, uh, extreme changes? Let's say we live in Toronto. If the Pickering nuclear plant has a meltdown and we get all radiated, does that radiation then speed up epigenetics and changes the way we are as humans? You see my point? Yeah, that's an interesting question that you asked. And in fact, they did do a study of the uh, certain plants around Chernobyl and they, did, they discovered that those plants were, uh, they were changing epigenetically more than genetically. So again, the epigenetic changes outpaces the genetic changes, if that makes sense. Uh, you, you're saying we don't have a lot of studies in humans. No, that's not true. Um, of those 130,000 that I mentioned on epigenetics, the vast majority were on humans, uh, most on cancers, uh, but also all kinds of illnesses because illnesses in general are epigenetic. There's not been a lot of studies in terms of, of prolonged 
study of how epigenetic features causes the next generation of people doing this. That's and that's due to limitations in time on generations. Uh, let me see. What what were the other parts? It was a very long question. <laughs> Uh, well, there's let's say a, a sudden release of radiation in our in our midst. Is that going to drastically affect how? Okay, you, you say. Uh, okay. I, I, I agree yeah. with you. Uh, probably illnesses were dying off of cancer because of epigenetics. Well, okay. But what about uh, here's, a, here's the thing to think about. If you if you saw the uh, Fantastic Four and, and uh, Stan Lee, everything he wrote was was based on evolution. The mutation occurs and, and natural selection, they became superhumans. So here's everybody up in space, they get blasted by cosmic rays and they all come back with superhuman powers. Um, that is the gene-centric concept of neo-Darwinism. What happens though is not that. There are some mutations that occur from radiation, but, but the bigger thing that occurs is epimutations. And epimutations are not changes in the DNA uh, but for instance, there's, there are genes, for instance, that should turn on to prevent cancer from developing. And those, those oncogenes can get turned off accidentally wow. by epigenetics, and then a cancer breaks out. And uh, this one particular gene that's very involved with all parts of cancer is called P53. And if it's not turned on or turned right off in just the right fashions, cancers pop out. And uh, so when that radiation hits, it's not that you're going to grow ahead due to DNA changes. It's due to the, the things that's going to occur uh, as an epigenetic change where cancer breaks out. Uh, but but it's inter isn't it interesting that cancers don't grow heads? <laughs> and that's part of the morphospace concept of epigenetics. You know the things that it does do relates to the bones and the and the and the heart and other things that get they wind up morphing. You know those those two hundred tissue types start changing because of cancer. So cancer is a type of <clears throat> evolutionary occurrence on a rapid scale. Um, so that's that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so. Jim has a question. I think he's muted. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Jim. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, on the epigenetics, what what about language? Now I'm looking at um, when you're talking about um, Jewish people, and and um, when I look at the original Hebrew, because I just recently looked at this. Um, because anytime I was looking for a translation, I would go to Strong's. But when I go to the original language of Hebrew, it's multi-dimensional. Like every letter represents a number, a, a symbol, a picture. Like yeah. I, yeah. I was fascinated by it, and I, and, I, and I've gone into a, a deeper study in it. Would this have that it's anything to do with a, an epigenetic start? Uh, it could, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting about this is all the higher critics were saying that Moses really didn't live around the time that all these things were written, okay? And they've been saying this for the last hundred years. And then lo and behold, uh, they've discovered just within the last month piles of uh, pre uh, sem semiotic, I believe it's called, uh, that looks that looks very very similar to the Hebrew letters, and that this stuff came about <clears throat> during the uh, uh, Egyptian time, about when Joseph was there. <clears throat> so now they're thinking that Joseph probably created the first alphabet, and uh, you know he had he was brilliant, obviously, but the the cuneiform of of the Egyptian was useless. It was the only good it was for is writing on columns that so-and-so was a god or this or that but in terms of writing up a grocery list it didn't do anything for you and so he was actually writing the first language and and he and by this they're saying that the is uh, jewish language preceded uh, the phoenician which they had always said was the other way around the phoenician and the jewish and uh so now they're flipping all that uh and when you look at it on the 
on the documentaries, yeah, it looks just like Hebrew letters. And that's what all these guys have been, there's a lot of people been claiming this. Now, uh, so uh, the question is, is how can this affect, you know, can this be affected by epigenetics? And I would say that epigenetics uh, is very much involved with language, especially in like bird song and things like that. I mean, who, you know, there's no mutation in the DNA that will cause a different bird song. I mean, the, the mutations take hundreds of thousands of years to call things. Whereas uh, a song that a bird finds gets rapid feedback as being useful uh, in terms of mating, you know, that that's an epigenetic thing. Um, now, as far as humans, uh, there's a lot of studying on that. I don't really tend to read those articles that much because it's really not my support. Day. But yeah, it's it's languages and epigenetic issue. As far as Hebrews and their language, it may be that what you're describing is what, part of the reason why they're smarter in general because they uh, because of the multifaceted aspects of their language. Uh, well, that well, that's that's what I was thinking because uh, I just recently introduced myself to that because when I when I was looking for translation I would go to the Strong's but when I went to the language itself I said this is multi-layered yeah well I have some friends that are trying to get me to, to, to take up the Hebrew I don't I don't know if I, I'm, I can be helped at this point uh do you, do you feel smarter already <laughs> uh, I, I feel stupid that I didn't uh, take it up sooner. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to look at it because um, I, it's it's so far beyond what I I, I, I could ever imagine. I, and I, I guess I, I it's the original language. So I guess, you know, it's 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 right from God. In well, the what, I find what I find interesting about about the Hebrew is that less than 25, less than 5000 words can make up basically what what we have we have five thousand words um five million words and they're all but but they can take a few words and make up so much so it makes yeah, you it's think only, out it's of, only 22 uh, letters it's yeah. only 22 letters and each letter represents a number represents a symbol represents a picture represents a meaning i mean it it you know it, it's it blew me away well, it's also part of the reason we have a YEC OEC debate, isn't it? Uh, if if more people were in the Hebrew language, there wouldn't be a debate. <laughs> uh, somebody has a question on a line and asks, "Does epigenetics uh, prove design in nature?" Uh, I I would say it does, but then again, DNA does as well. I mean, you look at when I went, you know, when I went to college in the late '70s, and I was a I was a Christian that had been really trained in, in scripture. I get into biology 101, and I just looked at the DNA molecule and said, "This is absolutely, unbelievably designed," and there's no way you can tell me otherwise. And so I didn't have problems when they were throwing evolution at me. Uh, to me, epigenetics just adds on a layer of design. I mean, it's just ridiculously designed now. Uh, and more importantly, what this tells you is that, you know, in my opinion, you know, in the in the global war out there of, of Lucifer and, and evolution, uh, they're trying to say we're just meat meat sacks and products of our of things and mutations. Now we have a way of looking at things that says uh, that God built into the system. A, re, a reactive thing that sits on top of the DNA to keep it going strong over billions of years. And it had to be so incredibly designed from the very get-go that it could handle something four billion years down the road, which to me is astonishing. Um, by the way, and I didn't talk about this in the talk, we have now discovered that the majority of the proteins in the body are what we call intrinsically disordered proteins. That means they, they're like slinkies, they flip around. They in fact have more mutations than the regular proteins, but because they can slink around like they do, those mutations do not change anything. And these things literally can stay the same and function for over a billion years. So we're talking about a billion years with no change in, in evolution, even though there's more mutations. 
and these and these uh, these intrinsically disordered proteins are very much involved with epigenetics. In fact, that p53 that I mentioned is an intrinsically designed protein. So uh, neo Darwinism was built on the concept of a four dimensional structured protein. And one change by mutation would cause a change in the structure and therefore natural selection. Now that we have uh, these intrinsically disordered proteins, it, it's, it's just another nail in the coffin. Neodarmism doesn't work. Um, and to think that somehow this protein had to, to know what's gonna be down the road a billion years to be useful. Um, I mean, that's, that's prolonged, that's looking down the road. <laughs> How would you know in a billion years that you're gonna need this or that? Uh, uh, as an example, the proteins involved in timing of the circadian rhythms are intrinsically disordered proteins. They've been around since the very beginning of life. And 80% of life, life on earth is controlled by these things. They're in 80% of animals, all the way from bacteria to human beings to birds. And this goes right back to the scripture of day four when he, when he, when he, when he revealed the greater and the lesser lights, because they are the, those lights help control these circadian rhythm uh, things, and it started you know a billion years ago, and are still going today. So it's it's not just a matter of he he revealed these things. It was it was hugely important. Without circadian rhythm, life can't live normally. And, you know, the fact that we find little things like that in the scriptures, to me, quite amazing. That's my last question. Chris had a question. And, you know, there's, uh, as far as science is concerned, there's, there's been like 100,000 or more different creatures on Earth since life began. Do you think that God works the way of creating a new species, a new creature, by just instantaneously producing it with all the DNA changes? Or do you think that he used some form of evolution by adding a creature and changing only a certain percentage of the DNA so that it formed into a new creature and a new one and a new one, that he was directing the changes much the same way that evolution is supposed to direct them by chance or by random? Choice. Do you think that God worked as an evolutionist to change things slowly? Well, that that's this that is the belief system of evolutionary creationists and theistic evolutionists, a lot of which I respect. Um, but I what I don't respect from that crowd is that they were all these guys were neo-Darwinists and just until recently, and they're all jumping ship on neo-Darwinism. So I, I don't believe in neo-Darwinism because it simply doesn't work. Uh, I believe in epigenetics, which is more of a Lamarckian evolution. Um, and, but how it is, the, the question you ask is, there, that's what, that goes back and forth. That's a very deep philosophical issue between a lot of different Christian groups. And I don't know the answer to it myself. Uh, RTB is going to say, well, we believe in the progressive creationism and, and uses uh, uh, Psalms 104. Um, but I myself, I have questions about that. I mean, I don't know. Does he stick his finger in there and poke the DNA and the epigenetics at the same time? Did he, you know, Hugh admitted to me one time on one of our conferences that he may have created all the DNA material during when he was uh, when the Holy Spirit was over the waters in Genesis 1. This may be a completely unfolding process from that time. Seems in, in, a, a bit implausible. Um, and that, that's because, you know, how could this stuff just, you know, go like that? Now, the, uh, the thing that you're, what you're describing is very much the, the theistic or the evolutionary creationists. They want to believe that God uses evolution to bring these things about. Um, but it's really hard to get them to, throw down on what their definition of evolution. Uh, I went to a conference last summer and I talked with Josh Swamidas and, and several other people and they all they all ran away from the word neo-Darwinism. You know, so they, they want to throw him under the bus, but they still want to claim him in a certain way. So 
Now, that first article that you saw on my screen, does evolutionary rethink, they're talking about what's called the evolutionary, the extended evolutionary synthesis, which includes uh, um, epigenetics. And, and I, I follow along that trail, but they don't have quite, they don't have answers to how things move, how we speciate. You know, there's just as, there's a lot of holes in it, but at least they know what their holes are and they, they stand up to them. Um, and they don't just arm wave and say a billion years and you got this. So I guess that's where I'm at. Oh, and probably if I were to throw the biggest question I have in my mind is endogenous retroviruses uh, and the similarity between us and chimpanzees and the fact that we have them. Does that mean that we they move around faster than we thought? Because if, if they don't move around fast and, they, and they're stuck in the DNA, like these guys say, then that does lend towards believing in a common ancestry, which I would not like to think. So anyway, that's that's my <laughs> my stance on things. Well, thank you, uh, Bob, for coming and sharing all this information with us. I think okay. we're going to call this meeting to an end, and uh, maybe we can have you back some other time. Okay. Now, you're recording this, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'd, I'd like a copy of it. Let me get it. Yeah, you'll get it. Everyone will get it in about a week. Okay. Sounds thanks. good. Th thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be in touch, Vaughn.